Now we're starting into the immune system topic. We'll talk about, first of all, the general introduction to the immune system, and then we'll focus on what's called innate immune defenses. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit. So first of all, our immune system protects us from a wide range of millions of different types of pathogens, viruses, bacteria, fungi, etc. Collectively, we often cause we call these germs, some sort of common term, common terms, but we're going to use the term pathogens. Pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms, so microscopic organisms. Some of them are not necessarily microscopic. You can find some worms that grow to be large enough to see with the naked eye, for example, but generally these are microscopic things. We're very fortunate, though, that out of the thousands or maybe even millions of microorganisms we encounter every day, the vast majority of them are not disease-causing. Only a very, 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 very small percentage actually can cause disease in us in the locations that they're found. A lot of people are paranoid about public toilet seats, for example. Well, actually, um, studies have shown that shopping cart services are actually much more um, dangerous than public toilet seats because there's more disease causing, more pathogenic um, organisms on there than you'd find on the toilet seats or the handles of toilets. And where's that coming from? Well, think about all the fruits and vegetables and meat and the bacteria that are on those, people's hands coming from everywhere. I mean, babies are cute, but they're germ factories, right? And there's slobber and everything else getting on there with germs. So, um, shopping carts, you've started to see. Um, wipes in stores where you can now wipe off those surfaces. <clears throat> so again, luckily the majority of those um, microorganisms we encounter do not cause disease. They're non-pathogenic. So our immune systems have three lines of defense. After we finish this introduction, this topic will be focusing specifically on um, the innate division here, which are the first two lines of defense. And in the future topic, we'll talk about the adaptive or third line of defense. So this innate division, the very first part of it, are the physical and chemical barriers. Your skin, um, these things called mucous membranes, bacteria that live in your intestines, etc. We'll talk about this more. The next line of defense that's part of the innate division, non-specific division, is called the non-specific immunity a variety of cells, proteins, and also mechanisms that protect us in a general way against all pathogens. And then lastly, the third line of defense, which is our adaptive immune division, is very specific targeted defenses that leads to, leads to long-lasting protection called specific immunity. The immune system is one of the more complex, in my mind at least, um, systems of the body. So what I think it helps to do is to kind of make analogies, make comparisons, in this case, a military analogy, which I know is not ideal, but it lends itself to it naturally. So your physical and chemical barriers, that's your first line of defense. Think of those as like walls, moats, barbed wire, landmines, all these physical things that the enemy, the pathogens, have to get through first. And if they can't get through those things, well then, it stops there. Right? If bacteria get on your skin but they can't get in, they die or they get, fall off. If they are able to get in, they encounter now the second line of defense, this non-specific immunity. These are immune defenses that are general. You can think of them as soldiers patrolling around the perimeter, fighting off anything bad or suspicious. And then if the, the enemy gets past those defenses, now it encounters this very specific immune response. These trained units like the, the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, that are elite. They go in for a very targeted strike, and they know a lot of information and fight it off in a specific way, and they can use that same plan of attack again in the future. So we'll be talking about each of these in a lot more detail, one at a time. Starting off with this first line of defense, physical and chemical barriers, is the first of the two parts of the innate division 
This word innate means inborn or it's there from the beginning. These defenses are always present, always ready to go to help protect you. Now the skin is the main one. Your skin is actually very, very dry compared to inside your body. Also, there are substances that are secreted that make your skin slightly acidic, and the salt on there, and other chemicals that are secreted in your sweat and oils that make it very difficult for substances to survive on your skin. Also, unless there's a cut in your skin, stuff can't get in. It's almost impossible for things to get in without a cut. So the skin is not the main entry point to the body. Instead, they usually enter through mucous membranes. So here, um, this kid, right, really cute, licking the pig snout. However, could potentially lead to um, spreading disease or a new jump of a virus species from pig to human. Um, usually it's not that kind of intimate contact that could do it, but um, it can happen, right? And so let's talk about mucous membranes, how pathogens usually get into the body than if they don't go through the skin. So mucous membranes include your digestive tract. So you've got your mouth, stomach, intestine, anus, your GI tract, gast gastrointestinal tract. You also have your respiratory tract, nose, mouth again, lungs. You've got your urinary tract, not listed here, but urinary tract. And then your reproductive tract. Those are the main entryways. These are all lined with what are called mucous membranes. These are membranes that have a layer of mucus on them. So let's talk about mucus. What it is, is it a bad thing? All that kind of stuff. So a lot of people think about mucus as being there only when we're sick, but it's actually there all the time. Mucus is a protective defense by our body. It creates a layer that pathogens get trapped in. And what happens then is when pathogens get trapped there, our body sweeps away that now dirty mucus and makes more normal clean mucus to replace it. And this prevents the bacteria or other pathogens from being able to penetrate the body further. Um, it traps them, makes it easy to transport them out and sweep them out. What does the sweeping? Well, it's the cilia. These little hairs that act kind of like um, oars in a rowboat all rowing together to push or a broom to sweep that up and into your throat where it can then be removed from, um, from that area. So mucus is always present even when you're healthy, it's a good thing, it protects you. Yes, sometimes mucus can get too thick and obstruct air passageways. In that case, it can be bad, but generally it's beneficial. Let's say that some of that um, bacteria passes from your mouth down into your esophagus and comes down here into your stomach. Well, in your stomach, it's going to encounter a variety of um, enzymes and also very, very strong acid that will kill the majority of those pathogens. But some might be able to still survive. It's not just the stomach that's acidic. Remember, the surface of our skin is also slightly acidic, has a low pH. Um, the vagina is acidic to protect it. Urine is acidic, etc. And they're all being protected. Well, let's say that bacteria did survive the stomach. They then move down into the small intestine and then into the large intestine. Well, in the intestines, you've got layers of mucus as well for protection. And also you have these bacteria, what's called microflora. You have literally trillions of bacteria that are living on and inside your body. You actually have more bacterial cells that make up your body than you do your own human cells. And 
these bacteria, we call them native bacteria or native bacterial flora, microflora, that are beneficial. Think about your intestines as like beachfront property. Everyone wants a home there, okay? Well, if all of your native bacteria that are not harming you are occupying that space, they are going to be competing against the bad bacteria that might get down there. And then they can't colonize it. There's no room for them. They get bought off, essentially. But if something happens that disrupts your native bacteria, now these pathogenic ones are able to take hold and potentially cause problems. Um, you can see here a variety of things, like having a big amount of these bad bacteria come in, or actually antibiotics or antimicrobial drugs. Yes, antibiotics are meant to help us, but sometimes they can cause harm by actually killing the native bacteria, and a variety of other things as well. Here's a quick question. Um, pause it, please. Read the video, or sorry, read the question, and consider the answer. All right, which barrier against pathogens does the skin provide? High pH? If you read it carefully, no, not a high pH. If that is a low pH, that could have been an answer. But high pH is the opposite of acidic. That's basic. Mucus? No, nope, not the skin. Mucus membranes have mucus. <coughs> Antibodies, we haven't talked about them yet, but they are not present on the skin. So, a process of elimination, in case you've forgotten, we talked about the skin being relatively dry compared to other parts of your body. That prevents pathogens from surviving on the skin and being able to get in it easily. Additionally, besides the skin, we have a variety of other um, protective mechanisms. We talked about some of these, like acidic secretions cilia, other things, enzymes, lysozyme in your saliva, your tears, enzymes in your stomach and intestines that kill bacteria, um, other chemicals in your tears that help to kill and wash away stuff, earwax can trap microorganisms so they can't get deeper down inside your ears. Lots of protection. So that was the first line of defense, these chemical and um, physical barriers. Now let's move into the second line of defense non-specific immunity. This is still part of the innate division. We have cells called phagocytes, which we'll talk about, natural killer cells, proteins that play roles um, fighting off microorganisms that are harmful, and then two processes, fever and inflammation. Before we get into those details, how is it that our defenses actually know what to fight off? Well, all cells and viruses have these markers on their surfaces. You can kind of think of them as like little, little flags. And these, these flags identify what this belongs to. These are called antigens. These markers are called antigens. So there's different types of antigen. There's self-antigen, which we have on our own normal cells. We say, hey, we're flying our own flag. We belong here. Or you could have an invader, something that's foreign that has non-self antigen. It doesn't belong to you. That's where our immune system will then target non-self, also called foreign. And I'll usually use the term foreign antigen. So the first type of cell we'll talk about is called a phagocyte. Site is ending here, if you remember. That means cell. And this prefix then here, phago, means eater. So a phagocyte, as this GIF is showing, is literally an eater cell. All it does is go around and find stuff to eat and gobbles it up and destroys it. The process by which it does that is called phagocytosis. Its cytoplasm surrounds the thing it's going after, takes it in, engulfs it, and destroys it. Um, we'll talk later about how some phagocytes will keep a piece of that pathogen as like a trophy to show to other parts of the immune system to activate them, but that'll be later on. Another important thing to note is that phagocytes are typically targeting pathogens that are present outside of our cells. Um, for our purposes, that's going to be mainly bacteria. So phagocytes are fighting off bacteria. I want to show you guys a video of a phagocyte chasing after a bacteria inside of a sample of blood. 
And this is a, a view in a microscope, of course. So to help orient you here, each of these circles that's almost perfectly round is a red blood cell. This big blob um, that's right here, this is my cursor. Oops, oh, that's a white blood cell. And this little tiny thing it's chasing after, that's a bacteria. So it's following this chemical signal, this chemical trail is being left by the bacteria as it moves and it hunts after it. Eventually it catches it, engulfs it through phagocytosis, destroys it, and then goes on to find more. That's its whole life, just eating stuff up. Probably all of us have had pus at some point, um, maybe not in our eye, but from a cut, for example, that gets infected or a pimple, you know. Uh, what is pus? So pus is a mixture of phagocytes that have eaten all they can eat and they've died. They've reached the end of their life. Um, bacteria that um, most are probably dead. Cellular debris, so parts of damaged or killed cells. And this fluid that contains a lot of protein in it. So all this stuff is pus, it's a sign of infection or an infection that is being cleared, hopefully. If you have a cut that has clear liquid coming out of it, that's your lymph fluid, not um, a sign of infection. So if it's yellowish or greenish liquid, that would be a sign of infection. We call it pus. So moving on to the other cell type we'll talk about here, natural killer cells. As the name suggests, its first influence, or first uh, instinct, I should say, is to just kill things, to kill automatically unless that natural instinct is prevented. And so natural killer cells, unlike phagocytes, don't target things outside of our cells. Instead, they target our own cells. You might think, why would you want to target your own cells? Well, they're not targeting our own healthy cells. Instead, they're targeting our own cells that got either taken over by a virus or lost control of their growth and became cancer. And then it works to destroy those abnormal body cells. You can think of it kind of like this. Natural killer cell has a secret handshake. And it goes around checking out all the cells of our body, trying to shake their hands. If the other cell has that same handshake, it's like, all right, you're good. I'm not going to do my normal instinct, which is to kill you. And then it survives. But if something happens that causes that cell to lose that handshake, maybe a virus goes inside of it, and the cell pulls back that hand to show there's something wrong with it then the natural killer cell does what it does best and just kills that cell. So here we can see that with a more scientific description. And here again is a little, um, a link to a video you can, you can watch if you'd like. But here we have this ubiquitous molecule. Ubiquitous means it's found on every cell in this case. Every cell in the body has this, even a normal cell or a, say, a cancer cell over here. Your natural killer cell has a receptor that activates it to kill. That's its natural instinct because the ubiquitous molecule is always there, always activates this receptor to kill. The only way it doesn't kill is if the inhibitory receptor is also activated. It's like, okay, kill me. Wait, nope, don't. Here's my secret handshake. We won't talk about this, but if you go into an anatomy class, or sorry, microbiology, they'll probably talk about the major histocompatibility complex this molecule that is the do not kill me signal. In cases where you've got a cell that's cancerous or infected with a virus, typically that is pulled back, that MHC, and now the instinct to kill happens. Some cancer cells are able to disguise themselves as some virus cells and put that marker or keep it out there, in which case then the um, natural killer cell would not be able to kill it. So here you can see I've got some QR codes for um, two videos related to two different types of antimicrobial proteins. Again, feel free to scan those and watch them if you'd like to see um, this in another view.
one protein is called interferon. It interferes or blocks the ability of a virus to spread in nearby cells. And so here's how it works. So you have a virus that enters a cell that turns on these genes that code for the production of this protein called interferon. That cell produces a whole bunch of interferon, which leaves that cell and it travels to surrounding cells, stimulating these cells to turn on genes to produce proteins to protect it. And this cell over here, it dies. But the signals it sent out helps to save these other cells so that they have protection there and it's um, sacrificial. Then we also have what's called complement. Complement is a number of different proteins that are going to poke themselves into the cell wall or cell membrane of a bacteria, creating this pore, this hole that allows fluids and salts to enter um, unrestricted, leading to that bacteria exploding. It's also going to enhance the process of phagocytosis, making it easier for um, those phagocytes to identify, surround, and take in these um, pathogens, these bacteria. So we have two proteins that are helping to fight off infection that are part of this, these nonspecific defenses, part of the innate immune division. Now to finish up this topic, we're going to talk about two processes, inflammation and fever. So with the process of inflammation, in this example here, we have an injury that happens to the skin. Now that excellent barrier has been broken, there's a cut, now bacteria have an easy way to get in. So what happens are these cells called mast cells. Mast cells, you can think of as like bags of histamine. They're filled with lots and lots of histamine and other chemical molecules that regulate this response of inflammation. We'll focus on histamine. And so histamine is the main player that leads then to the inflammatory response. Okay. So what happens is when this injury occurs, the mast cells release histamine. Histamine goes to the blood vessels nearby, causing two things to happen. One, those blood vessels dilate. They become wider. Why do they want to become wider? Well, what happens is they want to bring more immune system cells, more antimicrobial proteins to the site of the infection. So by widening, they're increasing that transport. And they also become even leakier than normal, which makes it easier for stuff to leave and get out and help to fight off that infection. So you can see here, it moves from the blood vessels into the tissues, phagocytes do their job, and these antimicrobial proteins also help. So dilation and le increased leakiness is caused by, in by the histamine released by the mast cells. Then that process stops, healing process occurs, sealing up that wound. Now moving on to fever. So similar to mucus, fever often gets a bad rap. People think that if fever is a bad thing, that we should always just pop a pill at the first sign of a slightly elevated temperature. Actually, that's not the case. Um, if we're talking about adults here, and you have a low-grade fever, below 102 degrees Fahrenheit approximately, you should not medicate it. Because if you do, studies have shown you will stay sick longer. Fever is actually part of your immune defense to protect the body. And we'll talk about how that happens. However, you want to be sure to monitor that fever, because in some cases, kind of like with mucus getting too thick, a fever can get too high. A fever is where your body's like, all right, we're going to set a new goal for temperature, and your body does things then to get to that new goal. So how does your body achieve this new temperature? Well, after it's been reset, and a part of your brain called the hypothalamus um, sets your temperature or resets it in a fever. For this, we don't need to know that. If you go into anatomy, you'll learn all about the hypothalamus and its many roles in the body. 
But one thing that happens is you stop sweating. When the fever is developing, you're not sweating. That's reducing heat loss. So less sweating, less heat loss, you start to warm up. Additionally, as your fever is developing, you'll still actually feel kind of cold or look pale because the blood is reduced going to the skin. You're constricting blood flow going to the skin capillaries, so again, less heat loss. And also, ironically, you'll shiver. Even though your temperature could be high, you'll be shivering because your body's trying to reach that new goal. Now, sometimes your body overshoots that goal and it gets too high above what the new fever goal was set at. When that happens, your fever can break. And instead, then the opposite happens. You'll sweat. You will stop shivering. You'll turn all red and flushed to bring your temperature back down to that normal, not that normal, excuse me, that fever goal temperature. So how is a fever actually beneficial? Well, there are three kind of main benefits of a fever. One is that at a slightly elevated temperature, everything's working a little bit better, a little bit faster. Metabolism's higher, tissue repair is happening faster to help fight off the infection and repair damage. Your immune system defenses are working better. While at the same time, the ability of the pathogen to spread is reduced. Now, this last ability here is not due directly to temperature, but it's due to something else that happens during a fever where iron and zinc, particularly, are sequestered. They're stored in your liver and pulled out of the blood so that there's not a lot accessible. And pathogens really need, especially zinc, to reproduce. And so with less of that, they're not going to be able to reproduce, your infection won't get as bad, and you'll get better in theory faster. So don't medicate a fever, monitor it, only medicate if it gets too high, especially in children you want to be careful because fevers can go very high very quickly in a child. Now let's talk about the role of the immune system here, and then we'll introduce how that's going to connect to the final and third line of defense, the specific um, defenses, which is part of the adaptive, or plays the whole part of the adaptive immune deficiency. So the lymphatic system, we said, plays three main roles. It reabsorbs lost fluid from your blood vessels. It also helps to collect lipids from your digestive system and transport it into your blood and then it plays a role in helping you to fight off infection. So how does this work? Well you have this fluid called lymph that's normally clear or white and inside this fluid you have white blood cells, our immune system cells helping fight off infection. We have some fluid from the intestines that contains proteins and fats that are absorbed. And what happens is microbes often get transported into these lymph nodes. And there's a whole bunch of white blood cells hanging out there, kind of like a lounge, just waiting. And they begin to attack those microbes and prevent them from leaving that center. The lymph nodes are also a key communication site between different types of white blood cells. So they help to produce more immune cells to help fight off an infection. As you can see in this picture, they help to filter this incoming lymph fluid so it leaves more or less clean, removing foreign materials like bacteria, virus particles, cancer cells. And so oftentimes when you're sick, a doctor will feel, especially in the neck region because they're easy to feel here, your lymph nodes, to see if they're swollen. Their swelling is a sign of infection. And the reason they swell is because you have this multiplication of immune system cell defenders that get ready to help kill the pathogens. And also, you get trapped pathogens here that cause the swelling of these lymph nodes. Now, different types of white blood cells, different types of phagocytes, are what are called antigen presenting cells. Remember I said that antigens were the markers that our cells could use to identify friend from foe? And so these antigen presenting cells are going to show this non-self, this foreign antigen, 
to other parts of our immune system con to connect these two main divisions, the innate, which was the first and second lines of defense. That was the innate. And then the third line, which we haven't talked about yet, the adaptive division. So here you've got a skinned knee. Invader gets in, some bacteria. It has non-self, foreign antigen. Our immune system cells attack it and begin to destroy it, but some of them keep pieces of that, keep antigen as a trophy, and they go and they present it to other immune system cells to help activate them. That's what we'll be focusing in on on the next topic. But for now, lymph nodes, these lounges, are sites that are common where an antigen-presenting cell is going to show this antigen is captured, this trophy, to other types of cells, B cells and T cells we'll talk about in the next topic. And that will activate them to help now join in the infection. As we can see down here, pathogens like bacteria are on the surface of the skin. A cut happens, they get in. Local responses occur, phagocytes gobble them up. Some of those phagocytes are going to carry antigen they collect, captured to a lymph node nearby. They're going to present it and show it to activate this third and final line of defense. And then those will multiply to create this big army, this clone army, that will go out to help fight off the infection.